depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm the moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap, as always, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on demand. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's webinar, you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can before the end of today's webinar. And also at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our three lucky winners. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is driving service reliability through auto scaling workloads on OpenShift. Our speaker today is Ara Polito, who is technical evangelist at Datadog. But before I turn things over to Ara, I do want to introduce Mike Waite, who is the Director of Partner Marketing at Red Hat, who wants to say just a few words. So Mike, take it away. Thanks, Charlene. Hi, I'm Mike, Michael Waite uh, from work at Red Hat. I've been here for, geez, probably about 18 years now. And if there's one thing that, that we have learned over the 18 years that I've been here at Red Hat is that our customers are successful using Red Hat products because there's certified software that runs on it, right? No, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux became a, a successful customer choice because you had Oracle, you had you know BEA, SAP, and all these other great applications that, that run on that platform. So we're doing the same thing today. We're working with companies like Datadog to test and certify their products on Red Hat's OpenShift container platform. And then I, carry a marketing budget to go help promote that in, in the market. Um, so I just kind of wanted to set that stage that we're really excited to be working with, with excellent companies like Datadog because we need those types of apps to make OpenShift a useful platform. So I kind of just wanted to, to tee that up and say thanks to Datadog and I'll turn it back over to Ara. Thanks, Michael. Um, so yeah, my name is Sara Pulido. Um, the goal of, um, of this webinar today is to understand why it's important that we are able to scale quickly our workloads in OpenShift and how you can do so fully automatically. Um, so just uh, so you know, Datadog is a monitoring and analytics service that helps companies improve observability of their infrastructure and applications. So one of the things that we do at Datadog to help you monitor your infra and your applications uh, is to provide you with a lot of um, integrations, like uh, fully off-the-shelf integrations. One of them, obviously, is OpenShift, um, but we have many others. So if you have any infrastructure, probably uh, you can start gathering important metrics and, and logs just by using one of those, those integrations. Uh, today, we are going to be working with OpenShift. Um, OpenShift is a Kubernetes platform by Red Hat that allows enterprises to run containerized applications in production in a fast, reliable, and secure way. Um, Kubernetes, it, it's an open source project by the CNCF, and there are companies that are building uh, platforms on top of it to provide more enterprise features. Uh, Red Hat uh, obviously has a lot of background on running open source uh, for enterprises and OpenShift is one of these platforms that can help you do so. Um, again, this is, um, my name is Sara Polito. I'm a certified Kubernetes administrator. Um, this is my Twitter handler. Um, this, my DMs are open. So if you have, after the fact, after the webinar is finished, you have any other feedback or questions so you need to contact me. Uh, don't hesitate to use to use that medium. And today we are going to be talking about the scaling. So um, as we grow as business, we need to make sure that our infrastructure is ready to, to start getting new users and, and more demanding users. Uh, when we talk about the scaling, uh, spe specifically when we talk about the scaling in OpenShift, we can be talking about uh, two different things. 
uh, we can be talking about scaling our cluster. So for example, if you're running an OpenShift cluster of let's say 10 nodes, um, scaling your cluster would mean to add more nodes to your cluster or make those nodes bigger in terms of CPU and memory. Or we can be talking about scaling our workloads. So it's scaling the things the applications that we are running on our cluster. So if you're running, for example, um, e-commerce shop, so scaling that application that is running on your cluster. Uh, today on this webinar, we are going to be focusing about this second case. So scaling the workloads that you're already running on your cluster. And I think it's important because we are going to be talking about uh, workloads that are running in OpenShift and, and Kubernetes, we are going to, it's important to understand how those workloads uh, look like in, in OpenShift um, and how the scaler, the scheduler works for OpenShift. Um, so this is very high level. Uh, so when you have an application in OpenShift, when you, when you deploy, uh, the minimum thing that you can deploy is a, is a pod. Uh, and a pod basically it's uh, it's one or two more one or more containers that share the network namespace. So therefore, uh, they can talk to each other. The containers that are on the same pod can talk to each other through local hosts. But also, it's important to know that the pods, when you scale them, so when you create more units of them, um, they 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 get scaled in groups. So you cannot say, okay, give me two more containers of container A, uh, but just one of B. It's a scale is going to, to be in group of pods. The second concept that is important to understand is that um, for to talk about the scaling, is that when you have a service running in OpenShift, uh, you can have many, what we call replicas of a pod, identical pods, serving the same service. So for example, when your front-end uh, service, let's imagine a very simple application that just have a front-end and a back-end service, uh, when your front-end service talk to your back-end service, uh, it, will, it won't talk to a particular pod. It's going to talk to a concept in Kubernetes called a service that basically is going to load balance the traffic between all the different pods that are part of that service. And, and these concepts are important then when we talk about how we can scale, specifically scale horizontally the, that application. So how does uh, scheduling works in Kubernetes? So when you, when you have, uh, when you have a cluster, for example, in OpenShift, you will have several nodes. And the nodes in your cluster is, is the, the nodes that are going to run your, your different parts, your applications. When you want to create a new, uh, a new of these workloads, um, basically you tell the API server, please schedule this, for example, this new pod. And it's going to be another component of OpenShift that is called, it's called the scheduler, that is going to decide what node is going to pick to run that, uh, that particular pod. So during this webinar, to make things a little bit more practical, uh, we are going to do uh, explain um, a little bit uh, different concepts, but then we are going to do a demo to, to explain it a little bit more. Uh, during this demo, this is the what we are going to be using. So we are going to be using OpenShift 4.2 uh, with something called Code Ready Containers, which is a way that Red Hat allows you to run OpenShift locally, specifically for development purposes, for example. Um, then we are going to be using uh, our workload is going to be an e-commerce application that I'm going to explain in a bit how it looks like. And then we are going to be using Datadog uh, for observability. Uh, the demos are pre-recorded, so we are going to see uh, the demos pre-recorded, but um, I it's basically what you can do um, live if you want to. So this is our e-commerce application. So our e-commerce application uh, has uh, one big front-end service. This is a, a, let's imagine that we have this monolith application uh, that is very big, this e-commerce, and we have started to, to create microservices to decouple 
uh, into microservices step by step. So we have created now a discount service, uh, microservice, an ad service, microservice, and it's all backed um, with a Postgres DB. So we have this situation where we understand that in order to be more successful to run our application as containers, we have to move to a microservice architecture. Uh, but while we do so, we still have this big monolithic application and we want to make sure that um, it's able to scale um, when, when our usage increases uh, while we are able to start creating this microservice architecture. Um, and finally, we are going to be using Datadog, as we said, for observability. So the way we uh, deploy Datadog in an OpenShift open uh, cluster, we have to deploy an agent called the Datadog node agent uh, in every node. So this is what we call uh, a daemon set in Kubernetes, where we run at least one replica of the node on every agent. Uh, this agent is going to collect information about the containers that are running on that particular uh, node. And also we are going to deploy what we call the cluster agent, which um, it's only one per cluster or more, but it doesn't have to be one per node. Um, and this particular agent, what it's going to do is start collecting information about the cluster itself. So information about the API server, uh, the services that are across all nodes, etc. Uh, so let's let's see with the first demo how our this environment looks like. So you can see I'm running CRC uh, 4.2, and I have a single node. Um, this is because I'm running locally. Um, this is a single node cluster, and I'm running my e-commerce application with uh, one pod. This is one pod uh, per service, one replica. And um, I'm running as well the Datadog agent. You can see there is only one replica of the Datadog agent. The reason is because um, I'm running just one node. And I'm also running the cluster agent that is gathering data from, from the, the cluster itself. Um, so this is our application. It's a very simple e-commerce application. We are getting here our ads and our discounts. And one of the things is that this application has to be uh, instrumented with Datadog. So we are gathering uh, APM information of our application. So for any service, thanks to Datadog, we can check the latency that we are getting, the number of errors per service, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All this information uh, we can get uh, live. Uh, we can also, if we want, drill down to a specific request and get exactly the, the latency that it got. Um, we can also get information, for example, about the P50 latency or P95 latency. And as, as I said, even though this is running locally, this is a full OpenShift cluster, and therefore we are, have access to the OpenShift um, dashboard with all the information about our cluster. So uh, this is how our demos are going to be looking like. Um, there are two main ways you can scale your application uh, in, in OpenShift and Kubernetes. One is vertical and one is horizontal. Uh, we are going to see both. We, we are going to start by vertical scaling. So what is vertical scaling? So vertical scaling in Kubernetes is a little bit different uh, when we refer to vertical scaling, for example, in bare metal uh, or VMs. Uh, in, in OpenShift and Kubernetes, it refers to the amount of CPU and RAM that you assign to a, to a single pod. And I'm going to explain quickly before we go back to, to that concept, uh, the units that uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes uses for, for this, uh, because sometimes it's a little bit confusing. When, when I say, for example, a um, 100 or a 1,000 M, it's, a, it's millicore, which basically is equivalent of, in this case, a 1,000 millicore would be a full vCore, CPU vCore. 
And also, um, I'm talking a lot about millibytes, which really uh, it's equivalent to megabytes. So you can um, just when 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 you say mi, just think about megabytes because that's that's what it is. Uh, but just to clarify that. Um, so going back to the example. So when you define uh, your workloads for OpenShift and Kubernetes, you have to assign it some resources. Um, in this case, uh, we can say for, for a particular pod, I want uh, 500 millicore, which is basically half a virtual core, and 500 millibytes. And what does it mean when, 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 when I write that on my YAML to deploy my pod? What does it mean um, practically? So what it means, this is basically a contract uh, with uh, the scheduler. Uh, let's imagine this example. We have uh, one node that has one virtual core and one gigabyte uh, memory. And then I tell the API server, okay, please schedule for me this pod that, uh, and I'm going to request for it 500 millicore, 500 millibytes, and the scheduler is going to say, okay, fantastic, uh, I'm going to put it on this node because it has enough space for it. Um, and then a second request comes in and say, okay, now I want a second part, a schedule, uh, but I want to request 600 uh, millicore CPU for it. And the scheduler is going to say, okay, I cannot do that because this node already has a contract with this pod that is going to, to be able to allocate for it always uh, 500 mil core. So what happens with this? And this is a, a very, um, when, when, when developers start moving their workloads to Kubernetes and OpenShift, this is a problem that they face a lot. Like, what should I request? Like, I, I don't know exactly what my pod is going to need. And what happens is that if you request a lot in this example, let, let's imagine that this particular pod uh, didn't need 500 millicore at all. Uh, but the contract with the scheduler is already there. So what can happen if you ask for too much is that your, your nodes are going to be underutilized. And that's something that we want to avoid. Um, the opposite uh, also works. If you, if you ask for too little and then you need more, uh, the scheduler is going to evict your pod very often. This is exactly what the vertical pod autoscaler tries to solve. Um, it's a component, uh, extra component in Kubernetes that you need to deploy that basically is going to make recommendations based on the data, that, based on actual data, so data that it's collecting. So for example, in this example, let's say that you requested 500 millicore uh, and maybe it replies to you actually that pod it only needs 200 millicore and 15 millibytes, and that's something that you need to do. There is three ways in which the vertical pod autoscaler can work for you. Um, the, the less dramatic one, let's say, it's just a recommendation. It's not going to make any changes to your pods. It's just going to give you a recommendation and you can apply that if you want manually. Um, the second way, the second way can work is on rescheduling, which means that it's not going to force uh, rescheduling your pod with the new values. But if your pod is, for example, evicted or um, deleted or restarted, uh, so it gets rescheduled for other reasons, the next time the scheduler is going to schedule it, it's going to schedule it with the new values instead of the ones that you originally put. And the third version, which is a, a little bit too, maybe probably too dramatic, is that um, it's fully automatic. It's going to, to kill your pod if it's going, is, if it's a lot different and it's going to reschedule the pod with the new values. So let's see uh, an example of that with our cluster. So the first thing that we are going to see on this demo is that we have deployed the vertical pod autoscaler in an OpenShift cluster. Um, as I said, this is, not, um, this is not a component that comes by default. It's something that you have to, to deploy. 
And as you can see, we have only deployed the um, recommender pod uh, because that's that's how we are going to to be using in our demo. So we didn't want to use a lot of resources. Uh, so we have here the deployment that deploys our front end, this big monolithic application that we want to break into microservices. And we don't know, so we started saying, okay, I'm going to request 100 millicore and 100 millibytes for it, but I don't know if it's a good number. So I'm going to create this other object called the vertical pod autoscaler. Uh, and I'm going to say, okay, don't update anything for now, just uh, give me recommendations. And I have been running this for a while now um, because to make sure that I got enough data. So as you can see, that object has been running for three hours now. And if you describe that object, um, you're going to see the recommendations. It's going to give you a lower bound and an upper bound and kind of a target. Uh, we can see that our CPU target was pretty good. So it's giving us 78 millicore, but our memory was off. Uh, so we need to definitely increase the memory that we, we are giving to our big monolithic application because it's using a lot more. So that was horizontal, um, sorry, vertical scaling. So horizontal scaling. Um, this is a little bit different. So horizontal scaling talks about the number of replicas for a particular service that we have. Uh, let's imagine that we have a service that has right now two pods, identical pods, uh, getting all this traffic for that service. And I want to make sure that we have three of them. Um, the way I do that manually in OpenShift is I tell the API server in a very declarative way. Uh, I don't tell it, give me just one more replica because I don't have to know how many replicas do I have. I do completely declarative the result that I want. So I tell the API server, server, I want three replicas. So what is going to happen at that point is that the controller, uh, in this case, the replica controller, the replica set controller is going to check how many replicas there are already in my cluster. I'm going to say, okay, right now there are two, so I'm going to tell the scheduler to schedule one more for me. This is horizontal scaling when we do it manually. But obviously, uh, it would be nice that uh, based on data that we get from our cluster, uh, some of these events happen automatically to make sure that even though we are not, we don't have to quickly change things when we, we start getting more and more users. This is exactly what the horizontal pod autoscaler wants to solve. Um, the first question that it tries to solve is how many replicas of a pod do I need based on resource usage? In this case, for example, CPU. Uh, let's remember that, um, for example, we have a pod uh, where we have requested 100 millicore, so we can create an horizontal pod or the scalar object, asking it to use on average 50% of the CPU. So we want to keep, uh, no matter how many replicas we have, the average of usage between them, uh, we want to keep it more or less 50%, and if not, scale. And this is uh, what we are going to see on the demo. So again, we, we have the same big monolith, uh, we have requested 100 millicore, and we are going to create a HPA, horizontal portal scalar object, saying, okay, I want minimum one replica, which is what we saw we already have, and a maximum of three replicas, but I don't want to, to be moving, uh, doing all these things manually. Uh, so I'm going to do it based on this resource. So CPU usage and 50% utilization. So in order to, to start doing that, the first thing that we need to do uh, is we are going to create that, uh, that object. And as soon as we create it, um, we are going to be, we are, we are able to get the information from that, uh, from that object. 
Um, first of all, we are going to check that for our e-commerce application, we only have one replica of the front end, as we, as we saw. And we can see that the, the deployment, the HPA, already is getting information about the CPU being over what we wanted. Uh, so at that point, the HPA controller is going to say, okay, we wanted to keep an average CPU use of 50% and we're already above that. So at that point, what is going to happen is um, that automatically, without, uh, without us doing anything, you can see that this new replica is starting to be created. And as soon as, if the CPU doesn't go below that 50%, it's going to keep creating replicas up to three, which is the maximum that we have created. Um, this is how it looks like in Datadog, all this event that we've seen. So as you can see here, the CPU started to increase. So we started creating new pods. Uh, you can see the number of replicas for the front end service going up. And once the CPU usage, uh, because we stopped the traffic or traffic suddenly it doesn't have any more, uh, it drops back to one. So this is a very nice way to make sure that when we need more, in this case, CPU, we increase the number of replicas, um, and once we are back to normal, uh, it decreases back to one. But uh, CPU doesn't seem to be the right, well, it doesn't seem, it could be the, a good metric, but usually when we when we start gathering metrics for our services in production, uh, we we want to have to to be targeting metrics that are more um, realistic. Well, well, it reflects better what the user is saying, um, and we start um, with frameworks like the Four Golden Signals, which is a very famous framework uh, to for metrics in infrastructure for monitoring infrastructure. Um, it's LETS uh, for its acronym, and basically it's uh, the things that we should be starting with is uh, gathering uh, or understanding the latency of a service, which is the amount of uh, the time it takes for, for a system to do some work, uh, the percentage of errors that we are getting from a service, the traffic or the amount of, of uh, work that our system can do in a particular time frame, so for example, request per second, and saturation, which is the opposite, is the amount of work that our system couldn't handle. Um, and this is what the horizontal photo scaler tries to bring uh, with the external metric server API. So because the OpenShift and Kubernetes have a lot of information internally about the number of pods that it has, the CPU, the memory, but when it comes to all these other metrics that we want to gather, uh, it doesn't have that information. So uh, what it provided was an API that any system can implement called the external metric server that can basically give information about other metrics uh, for that horizontal port uh, scaling. So in this case, we would be answering the question of how many replicas of a pod do I need based on any given metric that I have. Datadog, uh, so we have a lot of metrics uh, coming in Datadog, like we have, as we, as we saw on the example, we have latency, we have traffic, we have any other metrics that you can imagine, even business metrics as well. You can start gathering metrics like number of times, uh, number of checkouts that you have. Things are less about the infrastructure, more about the business. And with all those metrics, uh, it would be good to be able to also drive the HPA controller. So the thing that controls the number of replicas automatically uh, based on that data. So for that, the Datadog cluster agent implements uh, this API, the external metric server API. So what is going to happen is that um, Datadog cluster agent is going to publish those metrics in the as external metric server uh, for the HPA controller to consume. So that way, for any metric that we have in Datadog, 
we can expose that if we want we can expose that in 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 our cluster uh, for the HPA controller to use that instead of using CPU memory or all the things um, for example this we are going to see this in the example we are going to be using the latency of our service of our front-end service the big monolith uh, we are going to be using uh, a metric that we already gathering in Datadog called trace rack request duration which is um, coming from the uh, APM we are going to say that uh, we want to track this metric only for this particular service and we want to keep um, an average latency of seven seconds so our service is a big monolith that we are trying to make better but for now it's pretty slow uh, and we want to make sure that while we make it better uh, at least the latency doesn't grow a lot so we are going to to say okay if the average latency that the user is experiencing goes um, beyond seven seconds please scale uh, so we can make it lower and we are going to see this in in the demo so we can see on the service map this is one of the visualizations we have at datadog that currently i'm oh, sorry it started again Okay, so currently the latency is 6.21 seconds, which is good because it's below the seven seconds that we wanted. We are going to create one new object, one new horizontal scaler that says, okay, I'm going to be getting, instead of the CPU, instead of memory, I'm going to get an external metric um, from an external metric server that I need to, it has to be deployed. I'm going to be using the latency for the front end and um, please keep the latency um, below seven seconds if you can. So we are going to apply that object to start uh, gathering that, that data and making decisions based on that data. So we create the object and you can see we don't have, uh, the object is already created, we haven't had any values yet. Um, but if we describe the object, we can see that the cluster agent from Datadog understood that, saw that that object was created and started um, getting that metric for you. Um, so to check that, we are going to execute a command called the agent status in the cluster agent that is going to give us a lot of information about how the agent is running. And we can see here that it's already providing this new metric that we ask it for in the HPA, and it's already providing the first value, 6.5 seconds, which is more or less what we were saying. Um, if we do again, uh, getting that object, we can see that the target is still below seven seconds. So we are going to apply uh, fake traffic. We are going to increase, uh, we are going to create this container called more traffic, that basically the only thing that it does, um, it's going to, to make more requests to to our service after a while this is what it's going to happen and this is how we are going to see it in datadog um, i think that's one of the big values of having a lot of monitoring uh, and observability in your systems is that everything that happens you can you can then uh, check it out in case you want to do any post-mortems and see what's how things are going on so what's is happening here is that as soon as we start applying more traffic the again this is an example so we started applying a lot of traffic uh, the latency goes up a lot so to try to mitigate that uh, increase of latency what the horizontal photo the scaler did is to start increasing the number of replicas for that front end to a maximum of three because that's that's the maximum that we gave it um, and then when we stop the traffic, the additional traffic, and we go back to a latency that is around six seconds, more or less, it goes uh, below, definitely be below seven, it is go, starts scaling down um, again to one. And this is a very um, automated way to res uh, as a response to a spike in traffic. Uh, let's imagine that we have um, a big sales 
or uh, something that we understand that probably it's going to cause a lot of spike in traffic, uh, that way we can prepare before uh, with an HPA uh, object to do that for us without having to do all that manually. But um, what happens, uh, so one of the things that happens with, with HPA today, the horizontal product scaler as, as it is today, is that you only offer it a value. Uh, in, our, in our example, it was seven seconds. If it goes beyond seven seconds, it's going to scale up. As soon as it goes below seven seconds, it's going to start scaling down. And if you have, um, if you are driving your scaling events with uh, with um, a very stable metric, uh, it's okay, maybe it's okay, but if you have a metric that uh, changes a lot, uh, having just one value can cause a lot of scaling events up and down. So as soon as it goes beyond a number, it goes up, but as soon as it's stabilized, it will go down again and up again, etc., etc. To solve this issue, uh, Datadog has created an open source project. Uh, it's completely open source. It works in any Kubernetes uh, deployment, uh, OpenShift, as we are going to see on the demo as well, uh, called the Watermark for Scaling. And this is basically an extension of the HPA controller. And what it does is that uh, the most important feature is that it's going to give two values instead of one. So you're going to give it a high value and a low value watermark. And between those two, we are going to stop the scaling events. Uh, that means that if you have a metric that moves a lot in a band, uh, that band is not going to cause any scaling events. Obviously, scaling events are not for free. It's going to take CPU usage from your cluster to create that pod and to delete it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, it's not something that you want to do if it's not necessary. Um, some other features that the watermark board auto scaling has uh, is that you can say it at scaling velocity. So for example, if you have a minimum of one pod, a maximum of nine, uh, you can tell it, okay, just scale one by one, it's like weight, well, one by one or by a percentage of the number of pods, so it doesn't grow uh, dramatically, uh, very quickly. And also, you can set up some cooldown periods, uh, which basically mean um, the number of seconds that you have to pass before scaling again. So, uh, if you scale up, wait some, some seconds until you scale up again. That way, you can um, fine tune better uh, your scaling events. Uh, let's see this on our final demo for today. Um, so the first thing that we can see is that we have deployed the watermark pod autoscaler. Again, this is similar to the vertical pod autoscaler. This is a component that we need to deploy. Um, and once we have that, we are able to create this new object called watermark pod autoscaler. Um, and we can add as many parameters as we want. The most important ones is the uh, high watermark and low. Um, remember in our example with the normal regular uh, horizontal product scaler, we gave it uh, just a number of seven seconds. In this game, we are going to give it a high of eight, a low of two, which basically is going to mean if it goes beyond eight seconds, please scale, but then don't scale down until it goes below two. Obviously, this is a little bit maybe too too um, too big of a difference, but just to 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 see the the example, we are going to use the exact same metric, the duration, and same thing. In order to start getting those metrics and start getting those scaling events, we are going to create in this case the WPA object. Um, we have we see it here, and the same way we can check with the agent status of the, the cluster agent. We can see uh, the external metrics that we are getting. We can see here we have zero metrics probably because we didn't get the first one. We run it again, um, and we can see here we have the, the metric and we already got a value. Um, and we are going to do the same thing. We are going to apply 
a lot of traffic to basically force those scaling events. So uh, we suddenly start our sailing sales day and we get a lot of traffic and we want to make sure that um, we get the metric. So once that traffic starts um, being created and start causing latency, we can see this. Um, the latency for the metric that we care about, which is the latency that our users are seeing, started increasing a lot. Because of that, and thanks to the waterfall water scaler, we started increasing um, the number of, of um, replicas that we have in the front end. Uh, but we can see two main differences between this and the graph that we saw with HPA. Uh, the first difference is that, as you can see, uh, we don't scale dramatically one to six. So we go step by step because we introduced uh, some scaling velocity uh, to avoid scaling too fast. And the second big difference is that when we stop uh, that big traffic and our latency goes back to about five seconds, uh, the number of replicas stay on six six replicants instead of going back to one. Why? Because that low watermark that we introduced, um, in this case, in this example, because it never goes below two seconds, we stay on six replicas. And that way we can control a little bit more when we actually want to scale down. Okay, so after those um, those uh, demos, I'm going to finish by some takeaways. So the first takeaway is about the vertical pod or the scaler. Um, and I assure you once, if you're new to Kubernetes and you're a cluster operator, it's always very difficult for our developers who are starting to move their workloads to, to OpenShift and Kubernetes. Uh, to know what resources to ask for their pod. So VPA can be a good way for them to, to know um, how much they need. Um, also, the horizontal pod of the scaler um, can automatically scale horizontally, to, so create more replicas or reduce the number of replicas for your pods based on some resource or object data like CPU and memory, as we saw. Um, if you want to drive those events uh, with a more meaningful metric, you can use uh, external metric server like Datadog that collects any metric that you have in Datadog and you can use those to drive those events. So therefore you can drive those events based on things like the latency, traffic, etc. And finally, if you um, if just one value for your horizontal pod uh, scaling events is not enough, you can use this new controller by Datadog, which is completely open source, um, that allow you to fine tune a little bit more your events. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, this is the content that I had for today. Uh, I encourage you to try Datadog. Uh, there is a way to, uh, you can go to datadoghq.com to get um, uh, an account and start testing with your OpenShift clusters. Thank you very much. All right, great. We have uh, about 15 minutes or so for questions. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and submit it in the questions tab and we'll get to as many as we can. First question here for you, Ara, how can I create a Datadog account or Datadog account to monitor OpenShift? Um, yeah, so as I, as I said, please go to datadoghq.com to, to, um, to get a trial account. And once you have your account, that account is going to have an API key associated. Uh, so once when you deploy the cluster agent, <clears throat> sorry, you have a lot of documentation on how you should deploy. You can use Helm charts or YAML files to deploy the Datadog agent. One of the parameters that you're going to give it to that deployment is going to be the, your API key, and therefore it's going to start uh, collecting those metrics to, to your account, Datadog account. Okay, 
Great. Uh, next question here. Uh, for vertical pod auto autoscaler, we have seen that there is a controller we need to deploy. What about HPA? Do we need to deploy anything special? Uh, no. So, yes and no. So, the, the horizontal pod autoscaler is something that comes uh, by default with any OpenShift deployment. Uh, you need to make sure that you have your telemetry uh, components in OpenShift uh, deployed as well. Uh, in most of the OpenShift uh, deployments comes by default, so you don't need to worry. Uh, and those components are going to start collecting metrics around CPU and memory. But other than that, uh, it's completely automated. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, next question. Can the Watermark pod autoscaler work with resources uh, such as CPU or memory instead of external metrics? Uh, not right now. Um, so right now you can only use external metrics like the ones that we saw in the sample, but um, there is work going on um, and you can see it because, again, this open source is, is on the GitHub. You can see that there is work going on to also add resources to that. All right, great. Uh, just a reminder to folks, plenty of time for questions. If you do have one for R, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. We've gotten a lot of really good ones in so far, so want to uh, uh, want to keep going here. So the next one, what uh, security context constraint is needed for the Datadog agent or Datadog, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this is, this is a very good question because uh, obviously with security con contents constraints from OpenShift is a little bit different. Um, so there is, uh, so when, when we, we have documentation to use, for example, a custom SCC, uh, if you want all the features from Datadog, like getting logs or container information, uh, but if you cannot use that SCC, you can still get uh, some features from Datadog uh, if it's running on a restricted SCC. So it depends on what you want and you can what you can do in your cluster. Um, you can use one or the other. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, let's see. Here's a question for you. If there is there a way to drill down to a specific point in time with auto scale? It says if I do OC get pod and show all pods in the cluster, then I want detailed information on a specific node like auto scale for that specific node? Um, so this is, um, this is a, a question more about the scheduler. Uh, so when you, when, when you get um, the number of pods, you can uh, specify, you can see what, what node are they getting in. Um, if you have uh, in your, if you have in your, in your um, specification for your pod, if you have a specified, for example, uh, that you only want pods of that particular service in, let's say, nodes with label my app, for example, then the auto scheduler, uh, it's, the scheduler is only going to add more replicas in those nodes. So it's a combination. When you're using the auto scheduler, it's a combination of of the how how the scheduler is working for your pod and the number of replicas. The the horizontal pod of the scheduler. The only thing that it says is the number of replicas that it's going to need, and it's going to be the scheduler based on on this schema that you have for that particular pod that is going to make decisions on where what nodes is going to schedule that particular pod. All right. Okay. Great. Next question here. How do you manage time since a new pod is requested in HPA until it is ready? How do we manage time since a new pod is requested in HPA until it's ready? I don't know if I understand this question. Um, okay, maybe Emiliano, if you want to go ahead and maybe um, expand on it that. a little bit more and uh, we'll possibly come back to that one. Um, let's move on then. Um, let's see, how, how do you handle out of memory exception using BPA for Java applications? Uh, yes, uh, very good point. Um, so the um, one important, uh, this is not a specific for Java application. It could be uh, any out of memory errors, which is very common in, in many applications. Um, the One of the things that the scheduler, uh, how the OpenShift and Kubernetes scheduler works is that when you request um, the resources uh, that you want for your pod, 
you can say how much you want and the limit and set a limit if the limit um, if you go beyond that limit uh, the scheduler is going to mark your pod as the first one to go away if they need more memory for example so the that's that's why using the BPA can be very useful to make the right decision so this is not going to change how the scheduler works but it's going to give you a much better data on what to request and the limits that your application needs to make sure that uh, those out of memory doesn't happen that often. Excellent, excellent. Okay, we're about 10 minutes to the top of the hour. I think we have time for three or four more questions. Uh, let's see, okay, is Datadog open source and can I integrate this with Azure? Yes, so, so good question. So Datadog itself is a, is a software as a service. So it's a paid service that you have to register for. But the agent that runs in your infrastructure, anything that runs in your infrastructure is open source. So, for example, in this case, the, the agent that runs on every node is open source. We want to make sure in, at Datadog that anything that runs um, in your infrastructure, let's be uh, bare metal or VMs or, or containers, anything that is going to run on your infrastructure um, is going to be open source. But the Datadog itself is a paid for service. And also the second part of the question is, can I integrate with Azure? Definitely. So one of the things that, uh, that Datadog uh, has that is very important is to have many, many integrations. It has more than 300 integrations with many infrastructure services, and Azure definitely is one of them. So we have, um, this can be perfectly well integrated with Azure. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Heard back from Emiliano, who apologized. He said, sorry, I wrote it too fast. Uh, the question was regarding the time that it takes uh, when a new pod is requested. How do you manage the time since the rule required, uh, how do you manage the time since the rule required a new pod until it's ready? Um, I think the yes, horizontal is scaling. Okay, yeah. uh, so yes, uh, so that's that's again that's a little bit the difference between the HPA and why we wanted to create the watermark code auto scaling to to control more this. So right now the there is there is no way to manage that time. So as soon as the external metric server provides a value that it's beyond the number that you set up. It's going to drive a scaling event. Uh, so it basically what it's going to do is to it's going to be poking that external service event, um, and that's why the WPA is a little bit more flexible in the sense that you can say um, wait wait 50 seconds for example wait x seconds uh, before you start scaling to avoid that um, getting that number. But other than that you cannot control. You get the number from the external service metric server and it's going to start scaling. Okay, all right, great. So we have one or two more questions here. Is there any integration with any ticketing systems? Uh, yes, they are. I don't know exactly the, 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 which ones, because again, there are many, but if you go to uh, datadoghq.com um, and search for integrations, you can get a list of all the integrations that we have. Okay, I imagine that also applies to Kubernetes implementations that Datadog yes. supports. Okay, all right, great, great. Okay, uh, let's see. Let me just double check here, make sure we don't have any more questions up here. Oh, we just got another one in. What is the most important feature or top two of Datadog ob observability that you do better than competitors? Uh, so one of the things, uh, the thing, at least the thing that I like most, um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to, to say one thing that is specific um, to or general to any anything that you're tracking of, on, on Datadog and something that is more specific to what we are talking today. Um, so I think it's the integration between all the different features that we have. So uh, we have metrics, we have logs, we have APM, and, and we have synthetics, uh, browser tests, and all those things are super well integrated. So when you, one of the things that I like a lot is that um, when we were seeing those dashboards with metrics 
um, if I see something that it's it goes uh, that it's weird and I'm and I'm trying to investigate uh, something that is going wrong, um, I can click on any point of that metric and see all the correlations, all the correlated blocks that I have, any correlated metrics that I have. So, for example, you can have automatic correlations. So, if you have a metric that um, it's it's doing something weird. Uh, it can give you automatically other metrics at the same time frame where also we are. Uh, so you can start finding those correlations. You can correlate with APM uh, data, uh, with logs, all those things very easily. So I think this is very important when 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 trying to discover the famous unknown unknowns, things that you don't know what's going on, uh, to find to to get all the information that can be related at the same place very easily. And the second the second one would be, I, I would say, the integrations. Um, we have uh, not only for OpenShift and Kubernetes, uh, we have for console, uh, for Mongo, for Redis, for any infrastructure that you can imagine, we have very good integrations. What that doesn't mean is that when you start with Datadog, very quickly on day zero, you can start getting uh, metrics that are important for your infrastructure. Uh, just deploying those, uh, those, uh, or setting up those those integrations, you start getting that that data. And I think that's that's important to make sure that um, as soon as you start with Datadog, you start seeing the value of Datadog. Okay. All right. Great. So we are about four minutes to the top of the hour. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the question and answer period of today's webinar. But I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. There were some really good ones. So thank you so much. Um, before I do my closing housekeeping, I also uh, I would like to actually invite Mike back uh, onto the mic. Mike to the mic to uh, do a couple closing. Mike statements. to the mic. Mike to the mic. It, I, yeah. I just I just wanted to put a plug in for. Um, doing such a nice job, Ara, thank you. Uh, and for those that have joined here today, I noticed there's quite a few people on the call. Um, if any of you are gonna be in New York in July, uh, we're going to be down at uh, Datadog's uh, annual customer conference. It's called Dash. It's gonna be in New York City. Um, happy to meet with any people down there. We're probably gonna do a, an evening networking reception and, and you people who joined this webinar can be on the VIP list if you want to come have some have some dinner and drinks with us and with Red Hat and Datadog. So keep that in mind. And if anyone wants to take us up on that, my email address is is wait at redhat.com. It's just W A I T E at Red Hat dot com. Okay, thanks. That was my that was my plug. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Okay, um, I do want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. Uh, following today's webinar, we are going to be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website, so you can always find it there. Just go to www.devops.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Also, before we uh, close out today's webinar, I did uh, promise that we'd be doing a drawing for three dollars Amazon gift card, so we'll go ahead and do that right now. Our first winner is Jack F. Congratulations, Jack. Our second winner is Kathy with a K, C. Congratulations, Kathy. And our final winner today is Lynn C. Congratulations, Lynn. We'll be following up with all three of you uh, via email after today's webinar to get your $50 gift card over to you. All right, uh, Ara, thank you so much for such a great presentation. A great webinar, uh, great questions from the audience, so I know it was very well received. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for organizing. I appreciate it. All right. Great. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody.